So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, it's the 27th night and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept uh, this beautiful night of ibadah from each and every single one of us. And subhanAllah, I was just reflecting before I start um, on how amazing it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to see this night, to see these last two nights, to see this Ramadan. But just to remind everyone, uh, a lot of people wanted to make it this far and did not make it to see this night. There are a lot of blessed people that passed away before this night. And just seeing the pictures of the sunrise in different parts of the world and, uh, you know, knowing the fault of knowing the virtue of the 27th night in particular, without getting into details on the ikhtilaf of the ulama, on the, on the difference of opinion, uh, it's, a, it's such a blessing to be here. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from us all, that if this is the night, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us all. And if it is not the night, may Allah accept it from us regardless on another one of these nights. So just a reminder uh, to myself and you, do not waste time tonight. Um, and I hope you don't find the lecture a waste of time, but <laughs> don't waste time tonight. Please try your best to really exert yourself in sadaqah, in salah, in salah, not in salah, in sadaqah, in, in, in salah, in dua, all of these beautiful uh, attributes, inshallah ta'ala, uh, without wasting time. So make sure that when you're not uh, saying something beneficial, you're listening to something beneficial, Alternate between your du'a and your reading, uh, but just stay engaged as much as you can this night, inshallah ta'ala, and of course all of the nights uh, that come to follow. So the lecture that we will, or the portion of the surah that we will get to tonight is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرُ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسِ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا or we'll get to that later, actually, we'll, st we'll just stick to 68. Verse 68, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And those who do not invoke a God along with Allah, nor do they take a life which Allah has forbidden except injustice, nor do they commit zina, adultery, and whoever does so shall meet its penalty. Now, this might seem like from a Tuskia perspective, one of those ayat that you just kind of look over because you say, oh, well, that's not me. You know, I've never, I don't, I don't call upon anyone beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't commit uh, murder. I don't commit zina. So I'm good, right? I can escape this. And as I said, you know, in one of the episodes on Quran 30 for 30, uh, Allah would not put anything in the Quran except that it's a benefit to everyone that is reading it. And so if there is something that you are guilty of, you are attentive to it. If there is something that you are not guilty of, then you are also attentive to it because you ask Allah for protection and you seek refuge in Him and you pay attention to the lessons learned on how people fell into those places. So don't just gloss over this and then go to the other parts of the surah. And there's actually something very profound about this being included in Ibad al-Rahman because when you're talking about Ibad al-Rahman, you're talking about a bunch of do's. What is it that Ibad al-Rahman do? They do, you know, they, they, they walk with humility. They have incredible, impeccable character uh, with people that have no character with them whatsoever. They pray qiyam late into the night. They spend with moderation. They're not stingy, nor are they extravagant, but they spend wisely. And so it's a lot of what they actually do and not much of what they avoid. But that's actually a very profound point when you think about the way that Allah subhanahu wa puts this smack in the center of the description of Ibad al-Rahman. And some of the scholars say that just the fact that there's a portion that's inserted in the middle uh, right here about what Ibad al-Rahman don't do is to indicate that these are people that do not live a life of contradiction. These are people that do not live a life of contradiction. Sometimes you find very, you know, seemingly very righteous um, people and because you, you have these seemingly righteous people that uh, pray, that, that carry themselves with, with such uh, grace and such, you know, such beauty in, in the public space, sometimes they're deceived and sometimes they're deceiving. And the Prophet ﷺ talked about the hypocrites and he said that one of the things about the hypocrites is that they pray, they fast, they do all of these actions that allow them to be looked at in a certain way 
But when they are alone with the uh, with the forbidden things, with the prohibited things of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they consume those things. Uh, so they look to, you know, they, they consume these things in a, in a very uh, blatant way, as if there's no shame uh, with these things. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ If you have no shame, then do as you will. And I'm getting messages that my mic is a bit off, so I'm going to adjust the sound right quick, inshallah. So hopefully it will help. Okay. Bismillah. Inshallah, this is a little bit better. I'll try it at this level. I just lowered it. As long as it's not Darth Vader, then I'm good. Um, but inshallah, it's better now. I hope so. Okay, it's not better. <laughs> Let me try this again. Okay. I'm going to try this again and hope it's not an echo. And if it is, then I might just switch mics. Is the voice clear now? Okay. So y'all give me a moment. I'm going to switch my mic right quick to the laptop mic. And inshallah, it will be better. Bismillah. Ah, you guys can hear me now. Alhamdulillah. All right. <laughs> can you hear me now? Is it good, inshallah ta'ala? I see green bars on my end. Okay, alhamdulillah. All right, inshallah, I'm going to just try it this way. So in any case, as I was saying, um, the summary of all of this, that the ulama say that the powerful intervention of this is to say, that these are people that do not live a life of contradiction because the hypocrites in the hadith of Thoban, where the Prophet ﷺ was talking about the munafiqun, he was talking about the hypocrites, and Thoban said, Sifum lana ya Rasulullah, tell us about them, O Messenger of Allah. And Thoban, uh, he narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, they are a people who, when they are alone with the maharam, when they are alone with the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they consume those prohibitions. So anyway, I'm going to get back to this inshallah ta'ala. Let's go into the details of this. Those who do not call upon a Lord beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah Azza wa is speaking to a very specific uh, portion or element of Tawheed, the very element of monotheism. Why? Because this is a Meccan society where they associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different ways. Okay? So to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Dua huwa al-ibadah. Supplication is worship. Dua is ibadah. And at the end of this surah, the, the very last ayah, قُلْ مَا يَعْبَعُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا دُعَاءُكُمْ Say that my Lord would not take note of you had it not been for your dua. 
And dua here, as Ibn Abbas says, dua here means ibadah as a whole. So the word dua covers so much more than supplication, but supplication is at the core of, uh, of dua. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, by choosing these sins in particular to say that ibadah rahman are not guilty of these sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing to something that's very important, which is that the believer will fall into minor sins, but they won't insist upon them. The believer will fall into minor sins, but they won't insist upon them because kullukum khata, all of you are people who make mistakes. You're all going to have uh, all types of, of sins in your life. You're all going to make these mistakes. But the best of you are those who repent. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who avoid the major sins and the shameless sins, except for Allah, except for the slips, except for the minor sins that we commit throughout the day. So the believer, Ibad al-Rahman, are capable of slip-ups. They're capable of minor sins, but they don't insist on those minor sins. They are not capable of committing major sins and living a life of contradiction with those major sins, nor do they publicize their sins, which is one of the greatest ways of insult, okay? One of the greatest ways of insult uh, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you disobey him and Allah covers you as you disobey him and then you publicize that sin and then you boast about that sin. So it's not even, you know, it's not publicizing in that you're seeking help from someone. It is publicizing it as a means of pride as a means of boastfulness, that Allah covers a person and they still go out there and they expose their sins. So uh, the ulama comment on this and they say that the sins that are mentioned here are shirk, murder, and adultery. And I know some of you might just tune out at this point and say, well, alhamdulillah, I don't commit shirk, I don't commit murder, I don't commit adultery. So just hold on inshallah ta'ala until we get to the end of this portion. Uh, shirk, murder, and adultery uh, are the worst of the sins in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is according to a hadith from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says that I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, what are the worst of sins? He says, number one, it is to set up someone as equal in rank with Allah who created you. So it's to associate a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to set them up as an equal, the worst type of shirk, to give someone else that position of being your creator when it was only God who created you. And then the second one, to kill your own child for fear of sustenance, out of fear of poverty, okay? So the worst type of murder, such a filthy type of murder because of the implications of it is that you kill an innocent child, you kill your own child out of fear of, uh, out of, fear of poverty. So subhanAllah, there's a lack of rahmah, there is a lack of, uh, of connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's so much, there's a lack of, of understanding where risk comes from. There's so much that comes from this. And then the third one is to commit adultery, to commit zina with the spouse of your neighbor, with the spouse of your neighbor. So these are th those three sins to their worst outcome. Okay, those three sins to their worst outcome. Allah Azza wa mentions shirk to its worst outcome. Allah mentions murder to its worst outcome. Allah mentions adultery to its worst outcome, right? To commit adultery, with the spouse of your neighbor, uh, zina is bad enough. Your neighbor has rights upon you. And so to go to that extent is, uh, is of the worst uh, sins in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars also say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling, is speaking to the conscience, the conscience of those people in Mecca, to the pagans, because these are all things that though they were guilty of, they knew were blameworthy. Okay, they knew were not traits that were noble. It's very important, you know, if you read in, in uh, I think, a good history of this in Tafim al-Qur'an, uh, the, the history of, of Mecca, the history of the people of Mecca and how they actually looked at their idols. They didn't perceive their idols as having much weight. Uh, they didn't actually care much about their idols. Their idols were products. Their idols were their inventory. When things actually went wrong uh, or when they were actually in genuine fear, they invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They called upon Allah alone. When Abraha invaded Mecca, Quraysh did not invoke other than Allah. They didn't invoke the idols to save them from Abraha or save the Kaaba from Abraha. They invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That these people, they are in the ocean and they are covered by the darkness of the night and 
the dark waves start to crash uh, into the boat, into the ship. Who do they call upon? They call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They know their idols have no weight. And so they would switch out their idols as they pleased. Uh, they would say, you know, I don't like the way this idol looks anymore, so let me bring a new one. They would accessorize them as they please. They would buy and sell and trade their gods. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling attention to the fact that when you are in trouble, who do you call upon? Who do you naturally call upon? Even those pagan Arabs that were fighting the Prophet ﷺ for his monotheism, when things were difficult, they called upon Allah. They called upon God. And they knew zina was not noble. They knew that zina, adultery, was far from nobility, though they were guilty of it. So you have the story of, of the idols whose images uh, had been placed at Safa and Marwa, which were a man and a woman that committed zina inside the Kaaba and were turned into uh, into stone by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as punishments. And so they disgraced these two. They mocked them. They knew that zina was uh, a lowly trait, even though they were guilty of it. They were regularly guilty of it, right? There, was, there were all types of uh, zina-type agreements that the Arabs had. You know, uh, you, know you talk about early, uh, you know, the early practice of, uh, of exchanging spouses, exchanging wives, and uh, and, and a person even, you know, committing incest and a person um, committing zina with their own children, their own mothers, their own. These are things that existed that were prevalent in their society, but they knew they were lowly and they knew that they had no benefit to them as individuals or society. And they knew that murder was wrong, even as they committed acts of murder and they killed people for, for petty reasons. They knew that these were not noble traits. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the disbelievers by saying, Ibad al-Rahman are far from these things. They don't live lives of contradiction. And this is the impact. This is the societal impact of a people that honor God in their lives. This is what happens when you have a society of Ibad al-Rahman. There is rahmah to society. There is rahmah to society. There is mercy to society. People don't kill in the name of their idols. People do not, uh, do not, do not commit zina, do not, uh, you know, and in the process, victimize uh, either the more vulnerable of the two committing zina and any children that might be born out of zina. People don't, you know, end up ushering in these horrible things into society. And, you know, one of the things to, that, that you can point to is that these three things, shirk, murder, and zina, uh, literally line up as the opposites to the first three of the major maqas of the sharia, the first three objectives of Islamic law. Number one, the preservation of religion, then the preservation of life, then the preservation of honor. And so when, when people betray these three things in their lives, then the societal impact is one in which there is no rahmah, there's cruelty, there is, uh, you know, there's disgrace. And that disgrace is brought both upon the one who is calling and the one who is being called upon, both upon the one who is murdering and the one who is being murdered the one who is committing zina and those that would that would end up uh, you know bearing the impact or the consequences of that zina the loss of innocence in society the loss of honor in society the loss of of a nest the loss of lineage in society the loss of protection the loss of safety the loss of spirituality the loss of harmony so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying you know ibad rahman the goal is not to just have a few individuals that shine. The goal is to have societies that function with these noble ideals and that line up with the major maqasid, uh, which are the preservation of religion, uh, life, and honor. Uh, the scholars also mention here that these three things are all signs of the day of judgment from, 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 the, uh, from the biggest of the minor signs of the day of judgment. Okay, of course, you have the major signs of the Day of Judgment, which are when the ons as, as the Day of Judgment is literally at its onset. But then you have things that are signs of the ends of time. And uh, I'm actually going to add something to this, which is that it's not just shirk, zina, and murder that are prevalent uh, in the end of times, but it's mindless shirk and mindless zina and mindless murder. What does that mean? Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu when he speaks about societies descending into these three things once again, the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, talks about an element of, uh, of normalization and an element of desensitization and an element of just mindlessness, mindlessness. How? 
The Prophet ﷺ said that the hour would not come until you saw the, uh, you know, uh, the women of, of Dos, a tribe, an early uh, pagan tribe, literally committing their, uh, you know, their, their acts of shirk around the Kaaba, um, you know, uh, which was a, um, uh, uh, you know, a promiscuous type of dance around the Kaaba. The Prophet ﷺ said the hour would not come until you found people committing shirk literally around the Kaaba in the same way that, you know, the, the Arabs at the time were committing shirk. It's mindless. Right? It's mindless. And so shirk becomes a party, right? It, it really becomes a party. So there is a, a regular, um, you know, a, a regular disregard of God, a regular disregard of anything that has to do with the divine, open mockery of Allah, open mockery of anything that has to do with the divine. Nothing is sacred anymore. And because nothing is sacred anymore, then everything just becomes part of a, a material pursuit and uh, part of vanity. Right, so spirituality becomes part of vanity, and so people worship uh, not from a place of actual actual purpose, right, and finding purpose in that worship, but it's it's part of you know it's part of vanity, and so there's mindless shirk that the Prophet Sallallahu is talking about towards the end of time, right, and then there is mindless murder. Subhanallah, we see this everywhere now, everywhere now. The Prophet Sallallahu said there would come a time where neither the qatil nor the maqtul, the one who is killing nor the one who is being killed, knows why the murder is happening. The person who's killing really doesn't know why they're murdering. And the person who's being murdered has no idea why they're being murdered. But murder becomes so mindless, right? Senseless killings. How many mass shootings do we see all the time, right? And just senseless killing, uh, whether that's at the hand of oppressive governments, okay, and and... Uh, you know, foreign policy, including our own, right? Uh, just, just dirty wars, or that's the individual emptiness that just leads to mindless, senseless killing that destroys societies. The Prophet said, al haraj, right? It's just murder everywhere, murder everywhere. And then there's mindless zina, where people commit adultery and they don't even care anymore. And the one who witnesses it says it's not even a big deal anymore. As Paolo, the Prophet said that it would come a time where people would not feel shame to just commit adultery in the middle of the streets. And the most righteous person at the time would simply say, would you mind moving to the corner or could you move out of the way uh, as you commit your zina? That's the level of, of, of mindless zina that the, that the people committing adultery have no care whatsoever as to who's watching them. And those that are witnessing it regularly become desensitized to it. And so Paolo, I really, really want you to think about this and I keep telling myself I'm going to write something about this, but it's just been a little hectic in these, in these last few days. But, you know, some, some of you are already planning to get back to your favorite HBO series and your favorite Netflix series and your favorite Hulu series and your favorite whatever series and watch this, this, and that after the Ramadan. And I'm not saying that to dismiss you, because I know that the way that we rationalize it is, well, I'll turn away when certain things come up. Or, you know, I just won't watch that part. But think about the corruption of the soul and the heart in the process of that, that you just become okay with this stuff, right? It's like, oh yeah, it's just another scene, another, you know, it's just Zina again, you know? So mindless Zina becomes a feature of society where people just become desensitized to all sorts of things. And it's okay to watch these things and okay to consume these things. And that's not good for the heart. It's not good for the soul. And it could have devastating consequences on us. So what are those devastating consequences? Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talks to us about. And as I said, you're thinking, maybe at this point, alhamdulillah, I've never killed anybody. Alhamdulillah, I've never committed zina. Alhamdulillah, I've never committed shirk, right? Alhamdulillah, these things don't happen anymore. But here's the thing. No one, you know, no one says as a child that I'm going to grow up and be a murderer one day, that I'm going to kill someone one day. How many people that have taken the life of someone else unjustly never thought in fact, most people never thought that they would ever be in that situation, right? But the fitna increased and people found themselves in that situation. How many people, you know, thought, I will never commit zina. I will never commit adultery. That's crazy, right? That's, that's for those, those people, those other people, right? This is beneath me. But then what, what ended up happening? You got a little too close with your coworkers, right? And the process of infidelity unfolded where you developed an emotional attachment to one of your colleagues 
And then, you know, the late night conversations. And then the messages got a little bit more flirtatious. And then you rationalize it in your head and say, hey, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's figure out, let's do the secret in the cat on the phone, just me and you. <laughs> no one else has to know. And you just took it into this weird path. You rationalized it, right? And no one, would, no one ever thought, no one thinks that I'm going to do something this dumb before they get into it. But you get caught. And then it's a process. It pulls you in. And you end up there. The Prophet said that when it comes to faith, you know, there's a reason why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to maintain faith in us, to maintain faith in us, to, you know, like, to not let our musibah, to not let our tragedy in life be in our faith, that our faith is not disrupted by a world that's becoming less and less predictable and, and more and more crazy. All of the hadith about the Prophet, from the Prophet sallallahu about Holding on to Iman, Ya Muqallib al Qulub, Thabit Khalbi ala Deen, O Turner of Hearts, keep my heart firm on your path. What did the Prophet say would happen at the end of times? Mindless shirk. What does mindless shirk look like? The Prophet said, A person goes to sleep a believer, goes to sleep a believer, a mu'min, and then wakes up a complete disbeliever. And then something happens during the day, they read something, they watch something, whatever it is, and you know what? I'm a believer again. And then, no, well, actually, no, not now. Right? So they jump between faith and disbelief, and that's a dangerous place uh, for a person to actually be. But it happens to people, and it catches people by surprise. So asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to let you lose faith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settle faith in your heart, that Allah keep your heart firm, that Allah keep your steps steadfast, that Allah keep your thoughts pure, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you on the straight path. Masikni biha, O oh Allah. Hold me to it, cling me to it, hatta al alayhi, until I meet you with this faith of Allah. Keep me clung to this Islam. Keep me clung to this faith until I meet you with it. Make the best of my deeds, the last of them, asking Allah for husn al khitab, asking Allah for a good ending. Because people don't know how they get pulled into these things. They don't know how they get pulled into these things, but it happens and it becomes a process. And so, you know, the, the scholars of Suluk, they say that uh, each one of these three sins has a pathway. And while that pathway might differ from person to person, it has a pathway. And so the pathway to shirk is emptiness. Emptiness, a person losing the sweetness of faith, losing the sweetness of faith. And when they lose the sweetness of faith, then it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes like a worn out garment. And so it becomes old and it becomes... It's not, it's not doing anything for you anymore. So you're not renewing your faith regularly. And so a person has emptiness and then they, they seek to fill that emptiness with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then a contradiction happens where, you know, whether it's an unhealthy dependence or it's just outright blatant shirk on with something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have to expel one of those two things from my heart and I choose to expel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may Allah protect us all, right? So the point is, is that it's emptiness. Emptiness is the pathway there. Um, when it comes to murder, many of the ulama say it's anger. How many people commit murder in the heat of a moment, right? Domestic violence crimes, subhanAllah. May Allah protect us and protect our marriages and protect our families and protect our communities. How many people in the spur of a moment, in the heat of an argument, kill the most beloved person in the world to them? Right, or, or are violent with them, and then that violence unlocks the potential of a greater violence. Or, you know, in the midst of a moment, do something crazy and, and actually kill someone, hurt someone, and then what happens? I've got to hide that, and then they become murderers because Shaitan has unlocked that sin. But if a person doesn't learn to control their temper, they could find themselves in a situation where they become abusive, right? Let's put murder to the side. How many people think that one day I might be someone that would lay my hand on my spouse? You know, or, or hit my children violently, you know, like, like actually inflict pain on my loved ones. No one thinks that when they're young. And most people, when things are good, think that could never happen to me. But subhanAllah, they snap. And so the mechanisms of Ibad al-Rahman, of, of keeping ourselves guarded, of keeping ourselves guarded, protect us from going down that dark pathway. And then when it comes to zina, lust, lust, emptiness, seeking validation, Right? it starts off with just flirting and, and you don't even recognize it until it's too late, right? And it just, you're letting these sparks fly and the fire, it just catches on fire at some point, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, don't even come close to it. 
right? Don't even cut, come close to it. Put a barrier between you and it. When you start to see some of those signs, back off. Don't put yourself in a compromising situation because you're going to end up falling, right? And so there are pathways to these major sins that Ibad al-Rahman actively seek protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from. They don't belittle these things. Remember, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, ما أمن النفاق إلا منافق. That no one fears, no one is, that feels safe from hypocrisy except for a hypocrite. وَمَا خَافَهُ إِلَّا مُؤْمِنْ And when only a believer fears hypocrisy. And so when you start, when you stop fearing the potential of, of sins, even major sins, and you could find yourself in a bad place, right? Where you start to belittle them and you say, that could never be me. Inshallah, it never will be you. Inshallah, it never will be me. But put, put protection, put barriers between you and those sins and develop the measures of contemplation and reflection and systems of accountability, external as well, that can catch you if you start going down a dark path. If you start going down a dark path that can pull you back, whether that's internal Again, or external that can say, wait, hold on. And at some point, the external will fail and the internal has to pull, right? The internal has to pull because you can get around the external usually, but the internal has to pull and say, wait a minute, I don't like the person I'm becoming. I don't like, uh, you know, the lack of quality in my dua. I don't like the lack of quality in my faith. I don't like this disconnect that I feel from God. I don't like the emptiness that I feel. I don't like the anger issues that I have. I don't like the way I snap at people. I don't like the way that, that, that I somehow feel the need that I always feel like I've got to flirt with, you know, everyone from a grocery store clerk to, you know, a coworker to whatever it is, some random person on the internet. I don't like what I'm becoming. I don't like that I'm seeking validation from these places. By the way, please forgive me if any of this is hitting uh, too close. I, the last thing I want is for someone to make your app against me on the 27th night of Ramadan or to feel like I'm hitting at, at you. Uh, this is the lie a reminder to me first. A person has to be willing to remake themselves into Ibad al-Rahman. And in order to do that, you've got to have deep, honest conversations with yourself. Be like, you know, I, I think this is going down the wrong path. And who were the people that feared major sins most? The Salaf, the pious predecessors. The people that were uh, least likely to commit them. Uh, and so you find a narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Huraira, the person who narrated the most of the hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he is seeking refuge in Allah from a sariqa wa zina, from becoming a thief or becoming an adulterer. It's like, why you? Why, why would Abu Huraira be asking Allah in his dua to protect him from ever becoming a thief or an adulterer? How could you, you know, how could that ever happen to Abu Huraira anyway? But Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what did he remind his students of? He said, look, Iblis thought he had it made too. Shaytan thought he peaked. Iblis thought he peaked with his faith and with his position. And look what happened to him. And that's why when the Salaf would see someone fall, they wouldn't mock the person that fell. The first thing they would say is, Nasallahu ala afiyah, may Allah protect us. May Allah protect us from falling in a similar way. They wouldn't mock their brother or their sister when they saw them fall. They would say, may Allah protect us because... I might fall the way my brother fell. I might fall the way my sister fell. So I need to take lesson and heed from the way that they fell and protect myself. The Salaf also had a different understanding of what major sins were. Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as he was passing away. So this is a discussion uh, between someone, you know, two generations of the Salaf. Because the Salaf are the pious predecessors, the first three generations of the Salaf. And uh, this is a discussion between Anas, who's radiallahu anhu, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu and the Tabi'in, which are the second generation of Muslims, a distinguished generation with their good deeds. The Salaf, uh, the, the Tabi'in distinguished themselves with their good deeds. They took it to the next level with their good deeds. And Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said to them, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْمَلُونَ أَعْمَالًا that you do these things that uh, are smaller in your sight uh, than, than hair. And he says that we, the companions of the Prophet uh, we used to consider these things from al-kaba'ir, we used to consider them from the destructive flaws, the most destructive of the major sins. That you, O Tabi'in, you might excel 
in doing more good deeds. You might read more Quran than the companions of the Prophet You might pray more than the companions of the Prophet You might be distinguishing yourselves with your charity. You might be taking it to the next level when it comes to your good deeds. But we, the companions of the Prophet we used to see these sins that you see as more insignificant than a hair. Um, we consider these from the major sins. So there was taqwa, there was, there was a greater reverence. And so the way that they defined major sins was different uh, because everything is relative, right? You know, we talked about zina and what's considered zina now. Now, obviously there's the technical, the major zina, but the way that our eyes and our hearts have just become so used to consuming certain things, what's become foul language? What's become lavu, right? What's become, what are these things that we've normalized in our lives? Uh, to consume and to witness without really feeling any disturbance anymore uh, in the soul, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So what's the practical takeaway from this? The more a person becomes from ibad al-Rahman, the more yabituna li rabbihim sujjadan wa qiyama, the more they develop a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala privately, the more they become obsessed with gaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the process, holding themselves to higher standards that other people do not necessarily hold themselves to. And they don't belittle sins. They don't belittle sins. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Beware of belittling sins because it's like a person that keeps on, you know, it's like a bunch of people gather around a fire and each one of them adds a small branch. And then eventually the fire becomes so big that it consumes you. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala talked about the, uh, the belittling of sins, the effect of belittling the sins on the heart. And he said, you know, it's like taking a stone and dropping a drip of water on the same part of the stone over and over and over and over again until it destroys it altogether, it completely ruins it. So be careful, don't belittle sins. And the greatest way that we belittle sins is that we accept them as normal parts of our lives. Whether those are the sins of the tongue, or the sins of, uh, of, of, uh, of our actions, the sins of the eyes, the sins of the body, the sins of uh, the feet, the sins of the ears, the sins of, of, of what, you know, all of these different things, the sins in regards to our deficiencies in ibadah, we just accept them as parts of our lives. This is just me, all right? So I just commit this sin and I do this sin and it's, it, you know, it's not that big of a deal. And Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhu narrated, that there is no such thing as a small sin when you insist upon it, when you insist upon it. And there is no such thing as a major sin when you seek forgiveness from it. There is no such thing as a small sin when you insist upon it. And there is no such thing as a major sin when you seek forgiveness from it. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُدْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتْهُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, O oh my servants, أَسْرَفُوا أَسْرَفُوا Remember we talked about israf? Israf means you went beyond the limits. You went beyond the limits. أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ Say, O oh my servants, who went beyond the limits with themselves. Whether that was major, as major as killing a hundred people, or as minor, as backbiting one person, as major as killing a hundred people, or as minor as backbiting one person. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah because in Allah Allah forgives all sins. Allah forgives all sins. The companions of the Prophet were made up of some people that were adulterers, murderers, murderers, alcoholics before uh, before Islam. And some of them struggled even within Islam to reach the position that they reached. This is not a deen of perfect people. This is a deen of imperfect people that strive for perfection and believe that they have a merciful Lord that will forgive them so long as they make their best effort. So it doesn't matter how bad what you've done in the past is. You can put it behind you because you have a Lord that will forgive all of it. And Allah tells you, don't look back. Focus on now your new life. You turn the page, don't look back. But if you have that nasty dot on every day of every day of your life, on the, you know, that same dot on your page every day, you just turn the next the next day of your life. Today is the 27th, today is the 20, next day is the 28th. And that same nasty dot 
is obnoxiously there on your record, right? Then that speaks to a lack of commitment on your part. And that's major. That's major. So Allah can, can, can expound the whole book quickly and remove all of the past sins. Don't even think about it anymore. Don't worry about it. Seek forgiveness from Allah sincerely. In Allah يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah forgives all of it. إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Not because you deserve to be forgiven, but because Allah is forgiving and merciful. But when you keep on insisting on the same dot over and over and over again, that in and of itself is major and it has the potential to open up far worse doors. Far worse doors. SubhanAllah, you know, one of my, um, one of my teachers, Shaykh Amr Shishani, Habibullah Ta'ala, uh, he, he said, uh, you know, that, that what minor sins do to the heart, what minor sins do to the heart is so detrimental that it could literally lead to a complete loss of faith in a person's not paying attention. Why? Because to insist upon minor sins, you don't feel a sense of urgency to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, a major sin, when a person's in the midst of committing a major sin, like they have the potential to have a major aha moment, wake up call moment. But when it comes to the minor sins and they keep on committing the minor sins over and over and over again, the heart is hardening. The heart is, it's not just the sin, the, the, the degree of the sin and what that becomes in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart is hardening. And then, you know, a person doesn't realize, like, wait a minute, what's left in here? What's left in here? What have I tarnished in here? So be careful. Be careful with those minor sins because they can really, really destroy the heart. They can eat away. And they can become major sins just by virtue of how often they are performed without conscience anymore. So think about those minor sins and what they become a gateway uh, to. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, in Allah yaqfiru dhunuba jami'a, Allah says he forgives all sins, all sins. And so to that brother or sister that has felt unworthy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that feels like you've done way too much, uh, you have not done way too much because Allah's mercy is more than whatever it is that you have done. Allah's mercy is more than what you have done. I'm going to read a hadith. Uh, and um, Wallahi, no matter how much, Wallahi, no matter how much I read this hadith, uh, every time I read it, something else, just one word, pokes out to me. Uh, so I want you to pay close attention to this hadith. It's narrated by Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ الرَّحْمَةَ يَوْمَ خَلَقَهَا مِئَةَ رَحْمَةَ I'm going to read it really slow, in English and in Arabic. Verily, Allah created mercy. إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ الرَّحْمَةَ Rahma comes from Ar-Rahman. Allah created mercy. And the day Allah created it, the day Allah created this quality of mercy that is so necessary, that is so beautiful, that is so overwhelming, the day Allah created this mercy, he immediately turned it into a hundred parts. He immediately turned it into a hundred parts. So Allah created mercy. There was no such thing as rahma before. Allah created rahma, the, the originator of all things, even the qualities that we have amongst ourselves. He created rahma, and then Allah Azza wa put it into a hundred buckets, a hundred categories. So the Prophet says, فَأَمْسَكَ عِنْدَهُ تِسْعًا وَتِسْعِينَ رَحْمَةً and then Allah Azza wa Jal saved for himself, or he pulled back 99 of those 100 forms of rahma, of 100 forms of mercy. فَأَرْسَلَ فِي خَلْقِهِ كُلُّهُمْ كُلِّهِمْ رَحْمَةً وَاحِدًا And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to all of his creation one part of mercy, one part of his mercy, okay? خَلْقِهِ كُلِّهِمْ رَحْمَةً وَاحِدًا so all of the mercy that Ibad al-Rahman are able to express, all of the mercy between animals, all of the mercy between the believers, all of the mercy between human beings, all of the mercy that is shown, the mercy of a mother to her child, the mercy of a prophet to his people, all of that mercy comes from that one bucket of mercy, that one category of mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and sent down to us. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, because this is the effect of this. So what does it mean that Allah has saved 99 mercies for the day of judgment, for the hereafter? Allahu Akbar. What does it mean that Allah saved them? The Prophet ﷺ said, فَلَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْكَافِرُ بِكُلِّ الَّذِي عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ 
لم ييأس من من الجنة سبحان الله. So if the disbeliever was to know of all of the mercy which is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would never lose hope of entering paradise. He would never lose hope of entering paradise. If the disbeliever was to know what those 99 forms of mercy are like, what Allah has withheld, what is, what is two times the mercy that we know it look like? What does three times mercy look like? What does a hundred times that mercy look like with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, even if the disbeliever were to know what those, uh, what, what those 99 parts of that mercy was, he would not lose hope in paradise. But then the Prophet Sallallahu said, وَلَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْمُؤْمِنْ بِكُلِّ الَّذِي عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ لَمْ يَأْمَنْ مِنَ النَّارِ But if the believer was to know of all of the punishment which is present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would not consider himself safe from the fire. This is the balance of hope and fear. Allah has, his mercy has overcome his wrath. His mercy has overcome his wrath. We have only experienced one bit of his mercy. Every act of mercy that takes place either through Ibad al-Rahman or otherwise in this world is all from one part of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we were to know of that mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would not take advantage of it, nor would we allow ourselves nor would we allow ourselves to ever despair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the most wicked person would not despair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the next ayah, and, and just I'll close with this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa says that his torment, the person who insists on these major sins, will be doubled on the day of resurrection, and he will abide in it in humiliation. Um, Allah does not multiply or compound punishment for people beyond what they deserve. When Allah talks about the, the punishment on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and wifaqa, that it's an exact punishment. You will never be punished for a sin beyond what it deserves. But when it comes to good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, jaza'an min rabbika ata'an hisaba, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, awards it or compensates that good deed Ata and hisaba in ways that we don't deserve. So Allah multiplies the acceptance of those good deeds. So what does it mean? You that his torment shall be doubled for him on the day of resurrection. The ulama say it means two things. Number one, the sins that are between you and Allah, and the sins that are between you and the people. The sins that are between you and Allah, and the sins that are between you and the people. As the Salaf used to say. Glad tidings to the one who dies, and their sins die with them. You don't leave behind something harmful that hurts people after you die. You don't take behind, you don't take with you to the grave a sin, or produce a sin, or inspire a harm that continues after your death. You don't do things to people that cause them to make dua against you after you die. You don't cause harm that outlives you, okay? Uh, so glad tidings to the one who dies and their sins die with them. They're just between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't, you don't commit vulm, you don't commit wrongdoing and oppression towards anyone else. Why? Because when it comes to forgiveness, there are two things required for forgiveness from the people and one thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With Allah, it's maghfira, it's forgiveness. In Allah, yaghfira dhunuba jami'ah. With the people, it's al-ada wal musamaha. It is that you return the rights to the best of your ability and that they forgive you, you seek their forgiveness. Uh, and you know, sometimes, by the way, you try to right a wrong that you've done with someone and they don't want to forgive you, but you do your best. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy comes in, right? That you did your best. You tried to do ada and musamaha and it didn't work out, but you tried your best. You gave it your absolute best shot. There's only one thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Allahumma innaka afuun kareemun tuhibbu al-afu fa'afu anhi. Oh Allah, you are forgiving, you love to forgive, so forgive me. So with the sins between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's easy in that Allah azza wa jal is so merciful and he loves to show you mercy. You just have to ask for it. You just have to ask for it. Whereas the sins with people, it's a lot more difficult. And we often let those things go. And so the person that's being described here, a person who commits major sins, is someone who has sins that are both in the category of the sins between them and Allah alone and the sins that are between them and the people. Some of the scholars also say, يُضَعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابِ just refers to the intensifying of the punishment because إِنَّ عَذَابَهَا 
كان غرابة إنها ساعت مستقرا ومقاما. So what we talked about in the previous uh, lecture, that hell is ever present and it's ever consuming. It's a, it's a horrible place and so it's intense. And يخلد فيه مهانا that a person would abide therein in humiliation. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect this. And so this is the opposite of uh, a person who is honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a person who humiliates themselves, who humiliates themselves. And your brothers and sisters, um, you know, I want to really emphasize this point, inshallah ta'ala. Whatever your sin is between you and Allah, uh, don't just put it on Allah to forgive you. Put it on yourself to actually put barriers between you and that sin. It is not right that you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these nights and say, Allahumma khirli, Allahumma khamni, and you're not willing to do anything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or make any meaningful change in your life. It's not right that you call upon Allah with these things without showing a desire to be forgiven and showing a desire to, be, to have mercy shown to you by doing the absolute best that you can. And so I'm gonna, you know, I don't know who needs to hear this, but if you're going down that path of infidelity, cut it off. Cut off that relationship. Even if it's not quite there yet, cut it off from now. Put a complete barrier. Erase that person from your contacts and walk away from it, right? And, and, and get back to your marriage. If you're getting to a point where your anger, where your grudge is building to where, you know, things are getting violent between you and someone else, you need to handle that now. Don't let it get to the point that it's going to boil over. You're getting to a point where you're experiencing a loss of faith Take the time that is necessary to anchor that faith now. Don't, don't let it just, don't let faith just be this, this pastime for you. That's Ramadan right now, so I'm listen to some lectures, I'm going to do some things here and there. You know, like the most important thing in the world to me is my deen. And if I feel like that's withering away from me, I need to do whatever I can uh, to maintain it. And so, uh, you know, subhanAllah, a few years ago in Ramadan, I did a series called The Faith Revival. Uh, and... You know, it's, it's buried on the YouTube channel, uh, but, but please do go back and watch that, inshallah, Todd, if you're someone whose faith is withering away uh, or you feel that loss of faith, please go back and watch that series, inshallah, Todd, and make the most of it. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and show mercy on us. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us this late of al-Qadr. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to not just plead for his forgiveness, but to work for his forgiveness. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely expound all of our sins prior to this night, prior to these nights, and gives us the strength and the steadfastness that's necessary to completely change our trajectory with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray that Allah Azza wa replace those sins with good deeds, those bad habits with good habits. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us mercy in this life and mercy in the hereafter. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the punishment of the grave, protect us from the punishment of the fire, and grant us all Jannah to Firdaus. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us resolve the grudges that we have. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide all of us to the proper paths of recourse, both in regards to our transgressions that are between us and our Creator, and in regards to our transgressions that are between us and the Creator, the, cre the creation. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this model law from us. Despite its imperfections and its shortcomings, Allahumma amin, Allahumma amin, Allahumma amin. Uh, requesting your du'a once again for myself and my family, inshallah ta'ala, and the entire Yaqeen team, those that are taking the time out to do this right now to make sure that this goes. Please pray for all of us, inshallah ta'ala, and our families. And may Allah Azza wa allow an angel to say, Allahumma amin for you. And inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow we'll talk about what it looks like to turn the page. Uh, so the next ayah is probably the most hopeful ayah in this entire sequence of ayat, which is when Allah actually replaces your sins uh, with good deeds and what the implications of that are. Zakallah khayran, and I apologize for the uh, technical uh, lapse in the middle. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.